What did we expect? Did we expect that Horikoshi was going to keep the idea of consequences in his manga for more than one chapter like absolute fools? Maybe. Was I reading chapter 419 with an absolutely giddy grin across my smile thinking, oh my god, Horikoshi's finally figured it out. Finally, real life consequences. The Deku treating his body like a rental. But it's okay because his powers revolve around his legs. He'll just use shoot style for at least the rest of the story. And maybe in a couple of months or years when Aerie's power is strong enough that she can rewind him back to a time when he could give good hugs. Then, and only then, would Deku get his arms back. But nope. Less than 20 pages! I'm getting ahead of myself here. A lot of you are probably wondering if you accidentally cut 10 to 15 minutes into this video. No, you didn't. It's just chapter 420 was the first thing I consumed this morning. And I am filled with rage. Because while chapter 420 was a monumental step towards the end of MHA, with events like Korgiri possibly bouncing back from the abyss and helping out the good guys in the battle against All for One, which made Aizawa and President Mike realize that as role models in UA, it's up to them to bring back their friend from the abyss who was only 16 years old when he was abducted and turned into Korogiri. On top of this, we got Aizawa bringing together the worst version of the Avengers any piece of fictional media has ever seen, a crossover event from Horikoshi's other manga, Aizawa stealing a kid's shirt, Eri possibly losing her quirk, and Deku getting his arms back. So yeah, a lot happened, and I'm not a huge fan of a fair amount of it. And it's chapters like these that make being a fan of the MHA manga really difficult sometimes, as it appears as though we are directly back on path for friendship overcomes everything. As once again, a feeling that I haven't had since chapter 417 is slowly creeping up inside of me that's telling me you know exactly how this story is going to end. But why is that feeling coming back and what is the ending I anticipate? Well, we're gonna talk about all of that, but more importantly, we gotta talk about what exactly went down in chapter 420 of MHA. God, I hope Horikoshi was celebrating for this incredibly important milestone. That would explain a lot. So today we're talking chapter 420 of MHA Explained. But before we get to explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you love the idea of me talking about MHA and a bunch of other manga and anime, you're gonna love my anime podcast, Itaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you just want to look like somebody who keeps up with all things anime and manga, go ahead and meander on over into my merch store, which I'm having a hard time showing off, otakusanonymous.net, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. Listen, I don't want my dour demeanor to take away from the fact that there was some moments in this chapter that were incredible. The exploration of Aizawa, President Mike's, and Korogiri's relationship was incredibly heartfelt and touching. The ending of the chapter being the assembly of the worst Avengers team you've ever seen was also pretty cool. But Horikoshi's been doing this thing where he's been trying to make MHA darker, and he succeeded in that at least a little bit. See, ironically, the idea of making MHA a darker, more twisted story hasn't been great for its reads and purchases in Japan. However, American audiences absolutely adore the thematic switch, because we're broken and angry individuals. But Horikoshi's decisions to make Shigaraki this monster who disintegrates entire cities with a singular touch and all for one into this neo-punk mech baby that shoots bone spikes out of its mouth have done a pretty good job of making MHA a lot darker and more twisted than it used and with this thematic switch, we've seen the bad guys start to get the better of the good guys. As characters like Miss Midnight and Crust have been killed. Miriko has lost arms and legs. Aizawa lost a leg and an eye. And thus it appeared as though Horikoshi wasn't going to pull back away from cutting down some of the good guys. And that sentiment reached its peak last week in Chapter 419, where Deku, after getting into a double arm wrestling match with Shigaraki and Shigaraki's psyche, lost both of his arms because of Shigaraki's disintegrate. And this gave us one of the grittiest and realist panels we've ever gotten from MHA. I went so far as to say that Chapter 419 was possibly the greatest chapter MHA had ever released. And while I do believe that Chapter 420 is supposed to represent a thematic switch between the darkness winning to the light side winning, I think while it was done correctly in some capacities, it was fumbled in others. But in order to substantiate my point, let's break down everything that happened in Chapter 420. See, if you remember, Chapter 419 ended with Aizawa, Sero, Sato, and Ojiro emerging from a Korokiri portal, and the four of them working together to help Deku, who could use a hand. 
or two in this battle against All for One. However, Chapter 420 starts with a flashback, a setup to tell us how Aizawa got to the battlefield in the first place, and thus it opens with the immediate repercussions of what happened after the last time we saw Korrigiri in Chapter 368, when Korrigiri opened a portal to stop Aizawa and present Mike from falling to their deaths off the giant floating UA battlefield. And thus Aizawa, Mike, and Korrigiri are all on a tiny island. And present Mike has Korrigiri by the shirt, and he's shaking him, screaming at him to wake up already, which is actually therapist approved treatment for the mentally ill. Go and use it on somebody you know. President Mike then follows up with another super therapist approved method of treatment and screams at Korrigiri that Shirakuma's corpse shouldn't have been violated like this. And as he's about to punch Korrigiri, we can see that his eyes have begun to get teary. And Aizawa points this out, to which President Mike responds by saying, I don't cry. I'm a man. That's three for three therapist approved ways to go about your problems. Get this man some tweed jackets and some sofas. He's gonna set up his own practice. However, Aizawa points out that he's not talking about President Mike. In fact, he's talking about Korrigiri, who also has tears in his eyes. But President Mike says that's impossible because Korrigiri is just a nomu and therefore incapable of feeling. It's at this point that he takes a page out of another incredibly well-adjusted man's book, Colonel Mustangs, and says that Korrigiri's tears just must be raindrops. Mike tells Aizawa, that they shouldn't expect another miracle like what happened at Tartarus. Now, I actually have no idea what this is in reference to because Tartarus was chapter 297 and therefore like four years ago. And I haven't reread the MHA manga in a long time, but I think what President Mike is referring to here is the fact that when Tartarus was attacked, that Korrigiri wasn't freed. Because I don't think that he was, but genuinely, if you know what President Mike is referring to here, please tell me in the comments. President Mike goes on to say that him and Aizawa are 31 years old, no longer second years at UA, which is how old they were when Shirakuma die. But Aizawa reminds President Mike that Shirakuma was a second year at UA when he died, and thus he can't necessarily expect the same level of decorum and maturity from Korrigiri slash Shirakuma. On top of this, Aizawa reminds President Mike that Korrigiri literally just saved their life. And while for a long time we weren't sure as to whether or not Korrigiri was actually trying to save President Mike and Aizawa, or if he was just trying to get them off the battlefield in the battle against Shigaraki, last chapter and this chapter have all but confirmed that Korrigiri was in fact trying to save them. And thus Aizawa in this moment tells President Mike that they've managed to generate a white spark in a field of darkness that is Korakiri. Which I guess is kind of spot on for a man whose entire body is darkness. And thus Aizawa says, well, Korrigiri will never once again be 100% light. He will also never once again be 100% dark. That is to say that Aizawa and President Mike re-injecting themselves into Korrigiri's life has brought back a little bit of Shirakumo. And that now, as UA teachers, 31-year-olds, it's their job to guide this UA student as Shirakumo is still 16 until he graduates from UA, which would be another year, presumably because he was already a second year. And they only do three years of high school in Japan. And Aizawa is pretty much instantly gratified because after he says this, the mist around Korrigiri increases and Korrigiri says the word Yamada, as in President Mike's given name, Haizashi Yamada, which gets the man in Yamada for some reason crying, even though he's a man, talk about a beta, and saying that memories never die. And thus it appears as though enough of Shirakumo has awoken within Korrigiri to bring him to the side of the light. We then cut to Sukauchi, aka the cop that's always around in MHA, in the control room, and Aizawa is asking him over comms if Monoma can still fight. To which he responds that he can't, because Monoma hit his head in the battle against Shigaraki and is still unconscious, which is not good. If you're unconscious for more than like five minutes, you have permanent brain damage. Aizawa then asks Tsukauchi how many people can still battle on every single battlefield. That is to say that Aizawa is looking for dregs across all the battlefields going on in Japan right now and is trying to find the people who can still stand and fight to bring somewhere. I wonder where. We then cut to Aizawa appearing in an underground shelter, which by the looks of it has at least five heroes in it, three of which who look sick as hell. There's a guy with a shield on his back and like a full set of armor on, a guy who looks like he's related to Ed Shot but with a mechanical tail, a girl in a full suit with some kind of headband on with super long hair, and Ectoplasm. And the first thing that Aizawa does when he gets to this underground shelter is tell Ectoplasm that they can now use Korrigiri's portals. But kind of like a 20 year old Nissan Altima, he doesn't know how long Korrigiri's gonna work for. And thus he needs to gather as many heroes as possible, as quickly as possible, to get to a certain battlefield. And it's at this point that 
that none of the three to four incredibly sick looking heroes volunteer, who all, mind you, do not look injured, but instead rather death arms, if you'll remember as one of the heroes who retired after the excessive amount of public criticism that came after the Paranormal Liberation War. If you'll remember that him and Yoroi Musha, who was one of the top 10 ranked heroes, were the biggest names to retire after this arc. Now, we don't necessarily know what Death Arm's quirk is. We just know that his quirk makes his arm so strong that he's able to lift things that usually only heavy machinery would be able to lift. So he's got some form of an unnamed super strength quirk, and he's returning to the fold to help in the battle. Now, as to whether or not we can get Yoroi Musha, one of the former top 10 heroes in all of Japan, to come back, who knows, but probably not, because we don't even know what his quirk is. But Death Arms isn't the only hero to volunteer from the underground shelter. No, there's another hero that decides to heed Aizawa's call, and it is none other than Astro. Now, for those of you who don't know who Astro is, can't say I blame you. See, before Horikoshi was 420 chapters into MHA, he wrote another manga called Barrage, which is a 16-chapter mongified retelling of the story of the Prince and the Pauper, which is a story written by Mark Twain in 1881 about a child by the name of Tom Canty who one day meets a prince. And after meeting the prince, the prince and the poor boy both realize they look a lot like each other and that they were born on the same day, so they decide to switch clothes and live each other's lives for a little bit. Not such a great deal for the prince, however, because the poor boy came from an incredibly poor and alcoholic father who beat the idea of poverty into his little head. Then the king of the country dies, and the prince, who's now dressed up as a boy being abused by his drunk and poor alcoholic father, is officially king, and thus the prince has to get back to the royal palace in time for the coronation so that he can actually become the king. And thus the prince becomes the king, but he makes the pauper his king's ward for the rest of his life so he can live comfortably. Now, Astro being added into the story means that Barrage took place in the MHA universe, which is interesting, but it's also interesting for the rest of MHA because Astro is very powerful. See, Astro wields a weapon known as the Org, which is a sacred treasure of Industria's royal family, which he's seen having in this chapter. And the Org, at least in Barrage, starts as a weapon that allows him to create a spear of energy that can be charged up, thrown at incredible speeds that can punch through any different types of enemies, and that can be called back to Astro's hand. Essentially, it's like Mjolnir, except later on in Barrage, the Org is also found out to be able to change in shape. And Astro, upon finding this out, turns it into a blade that can change its length. On top of this, in a one-shot tied into the Barrage universe, Astro can also make black holes that just suck in everything around him. And though if he gets too reckless with these black holes, he can even suck himself into them, so they're kind of a double-edged sword. But yeah, Astro being injected into the story could either just be Horikoshi being like, ah, go read my previous manga, or could be the introduction of one of the more powerful heroes in the universe. Who knows? It's so quirky. After this possible massive reveal, we get a cut to the citizen who didn't want to let Deku back into UA, taking off his All Might shirt, which is a weirdly accurate synopsis of those who claim to be, you know. But the citizen has made a realization that a lot of the, you know, don't, as he takes off his All Might shirt and gives it to Aizawa and tells him to use it to treat a hero's wound. At which point, a bunch of citizens come over and all take their clothes off and give it to Aizawa and they're like, use this. Listen, I, I get the symbology, but I think, I think we have fabric. We got a girl who can make cannons just by eating a slightly big lunch. We got an old lady who can heal disintegrated bones with a smooch. But it's it, it's cool moment. It's a full circle moment for everybody. Sugauchi then tells Aizawa, who's just got a handful of clothes, that the Takuba battle still isn't over. And for those of you who don't remember what was happening over at the Takuba battle, I can't blame you. We haven't exactly been getting updates from it. So the Takuba battle is between Wash, Saro, Sato, and Ryoku, all battling it out against Gashly, who we know nothing about. Though we do know that Gashly is based off Gashly Crumb's Tinies, which is a book that teaches you the alphabet through the medium of child death. Like E is for Ernest, who choked on a peach. G is for George, smothered under a rug. Every single letter taught to you through the medium of a child dying. And the main character of these books is a tall man dressed in a black coat with a white face, a top hat, and a black umbrella. And Horikoshi adds all this and goes so far as to give Gashly a book. Now, it's not too easy to make out what Gashly's ability appears to be, but he appears to be able to control some convulsing mass of... Uh, baby 
things. Listen, it appears to be an absolute and complete nightmare. It is not the place I would have wanted to be fighting. But since the Battle of Takaba is still ongoing, and there's heroes there who can keep fighting, Aizawa sends Tokage, Kamakiri, and Ectoplasm to that battlefield to once and for all defeat Gashly. After which Aizawa says phase three of the divide and conquer strategy, start. Finally, after this, we cut back to the present, where Aizawa is asking Deku how long it's been since he lost his arms. And Deku says he doesn't really know because it all happened in Shigaraki's mental world. And Deku then doubles down to say that at UA, he could feel Shigaraki rallying against All for One, but he no longer feels his presence. Okay. Oh no, Shigaraki's gone. He's gonna be gone forever. We're gonna have to kill All for One. He literally said he heard an echo the second he took over Shigaraki's body. We then get another flashback, specifically to the underground shelter where Aizawa was, where Eri also was. In this flashback, Eri is handing her horn to Aizawa. Now, for those of you who don't remember how Eri's quirk works, essentially, Eri's power is stored in her horn, and therefore, the bigger her horn is, the more rewinding she can do. Because right before the war kicked off, Eri rewinded Mirio to give him his quirk back. Her horn is about as small as it's ever been. And thus, a couple of chapters ago, when Eri was trying to get to the battlefield where Deku was, she was reminded by Ectoplasm that one, she wouldn't be able to get there, and two, even if she could, she probably couldn't rewind him because her power was so dwindled. However, Eri understands that Aizawa is going to the battlefield, and thus, even though she can't go to the battlefield, she wants her horn to. Aizawa, naturally concerned by the fact that Eri just sliced off a part of her face, asks how she did that. I don't know how Ectoplasm was able to help her cut her horn off, because his entire quirk revolves around him just being able to make shadow clones. Maybe he gave her a wallet to bite down on while he sliced it off with a butter knife. I, do I genuinely don't know. Aizawa, probably pretty concerned by the fact that Ectoplasm allowed a child to mutilate herself, apologizes, and then blames it on Aizawa, because Eri apparently learned from him. Which I guess is fair, because he cut off his own leg, saying that she's rational like Aizawa, but also does crazy things from time to time. I don't know if I would call Aizawa cutting off his own leg, when if he didn't cut off his own leg, he would have lost his quirk to one of Eri's quirk decay bullets. Crazy necessarily, it was more just the right thing to do in the moment, but maybe Eri cutting off her horn is the right thing to do in the moment. Aizawa then tells Eri that this might permanently damage her quirk, which like, how could he possibly know that? And Eri says that she's wanted to do this to help All Might and Deku, but she couldn't. So now she wants to help in any way that she can. And listen, if technically this does destroy Eri's quirk, I am all for it. Ares Quirk is one of the largest plot devices in this entire story. Anytime somebody is grievously injured, we can basically just go, well, so long as they get to Airy eventually, they'll be fine. Oh, Mirio lost his quirk? Don't worry, we can rewind him back to when he still had a quirk. Oh, Mirko lost her arm and leg? Don't worry, we can rewind her back to when she had all those. Oh, Dobby looks like Anakin Skywalker with low ground? Don't worry, so long as he accepts the light and lord of endeavor into his heart, we can rewind him back to when he was less crispy. Oh, Deku lost his arms? Don't worry, so long as he gets to this battle through the power of his legs, we can rewind him back to when he had arms. Basically, Eri was the much more broken and much younger version of Recovery Girl. And if her cutting off her horn to give it to Deku to heal him for one last time is the last time that we get to use Eri's horn as a plot device, I would be super down for that. Because, well, yes, obviously, I would love to see Mirko back at full power. If Mirko was a head in a jar like Ronald Reagan in Futurama, I'd still think she'd want to go out and battle against Nomu. She'll be fine. And while all my definitely isn't crushing it right now in the health department, he's also not dead. And he'll also be able to make a full recovery. And also, if he can't make a full recovery, not the end of the world. He's not All Might anymore. But am I sitting here and saying that one chapter after Deku lost his arms, I wanted Aerie to mutilate herself and send his horn to Deku so he could get his arms back? God, no. But we'll catch that in a second. Eri then says that her dream one day is to sing like Jiro. You know, earphone jack. And that she wants Deku and everybody else to have fun when the war is over. And thus, even if it means losing her quirk, she wants Deku to come out clean. We then cut back to the battlefield, where Aizawa is prodding Deku in what's left of one of his arms with Eri's decapitated horn. At which point, Ectoplasm says that Eri didn't have much energy. And thus, while the translation I'm reading says this, I believe it might be a mistranslation, Ectoplasm says that it's going to take two to three minutes for Deku to heal. I don't think that's what it actually says, though. I believe what Ectoplasm says is that it probably will only be able 
able to heal you two to three minutes back into the past because that's much more in line with how Ares quirk works because wouldn't you know it as soon as Deku gets his new dose of 5G his arms start to rematerialize Aizawa then says that Deku can't die until he hears Ares sing and it's at that point that Aizawa might as well say on your left because a myriad of Korrigiri portals open up and every hero who's still able to breathe steps out of them but Nick is it big hitters like Mirio and Monoma, Present Mike, the guy with the revolver. Ah. Uh. No? Outside of Saro, Sato, and Ojiro, who are already here, we get a bunch of no-names and Killer Orca, who admittedly is a good bull, Annie Voice, Dupla Arms, Momo, Mineta, and Denki, who's already doing his I used too much electricity face. That is five certified D-listers. Oh, but Nick Momo can make anything she needs. Yeah, okay, let's say hypothetically she makes a net or a gun. It's not gonna do anything to all for one. Oh, Nick, but Duple Arms and Annie Boys just had a big power-up in their battle against Spinner. Yes, in their battle against Spinner, the dude who lost his mind after holding three quirks. Even Mineta's only got one eye. But objectively, they're not here to defeat all for one. Yes, are they going to play a role? Yes, are they gonna make an opening for Deku? Yes, Yes, is Deku going to capitalize on that opening to finally beat all for one and bring Shigaraki back to the surface? Probably, because once again, that is directly the ending that we are spiraling towards. It's very much supposed to be an Avengers Assemble moment. Deku is supposed to be Captain America with his newfound weapons, Mjolnir, and uh, I don't remember what the axe was called. I don't care about Marvel. Da Dawn Breaker. We're going to go with that. Now everybody, when they leave their portals, says that they're exhausted, but that they're going to do their best, which I tend to believe. But here's the thing. If everybody who left those portals was at maximum power, they still wouldn't stand much of a chance against All for One. Except, of course, when you acknowledge the fact that All for One's already admitted that Shigaraki as a vessel has been destroyed, and the fact that there is still an echo of Shigaraki in that good old head. So what's gonna happen, Nick? How's the story gonna end? Well, ironically, pretty similar to how JJK is panning out right now. A big team up of people who shouldn't be battling against the main bad guy is gonna create an opening for the main good guy to knock down the main bad guy until he's weak enough for the voices inside of his head to finally bounce back. Because Shigaraki has now realized beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's been used his entire lifetime and every decision he's ever made wasn't his own. And thus, when All for One is at his weakest, Shigaraki will bounce back with a fit of rage to try and take back his life and will recede control of his spot, at which point he'll realize that the villain life he's been living his entire life is because All for One directed him in that way, and that Deku still sees the good in him. And thus Shigaraki will swear off the villain lifestyle he's been living because it means living the way that All for One wants him to live, and he hates All for One. At which point Shigaraki will probably go to jail for the rest of his life, but at least he'll be on the path of reformation. <sighs> We were heading in such a good direction. Listen, I'm not saying I wanted Deku to not have his arms for the rest of his life, but for the entire story, there has been tons and tons of death flags specifically for Deku's arms. Every time Deku threw a too powerful punch, he was like, well, I wonder if he'll be able to use my arm after this. And so Deku started wearing gloves and support items on his arms to lessen the load that they were bearing. He started to adapt one for all to the shoot style, away from the way he wanted to use one for all because he wasn't All Might. And thus Deku probably could have had his arms cauterized by somebody with a fire-esque quirk who just came through one of the portals and could have continued his battle against All for One just using his shoot style and therefore truly cementing that Deku was going to win using his own strength and abilities because shoot style is completely separate from anything that All Might gave him. And yet when push came to shove, Horikoshi folded harder than J. Cole apologizing 24 hours after releasing a diss track to Kendrick. Like, I don't care what anybody says, this is death bait. And while some of us would have have to be completely daft to believe that at one point or another, Eri wouldn't rewind Deku's body to give him arms back. One chapter later? What was the point of getting rid of them? Shock value for a week? Like sure, you can say you've created a moment of high tension where Deku's at his absolute lowest, but you can pull Deku out of that pit of despair by either giving him his arms back or bringing every hero who can still stand onto the battlefield, but doing both cheapens the former. <sighs> I'm tired. I just want the story to end. It'll be a fine ending. Like, no one's gonna complain about Shigaraki breaking through and retaking over All for One's body. But I just... I just thought for a week 
maybe we were getting something different and we're not. But who knows? Maybe I'm being dramatic. Maybe Deku will lose his legs in chapter 421 and then get him back in 422. What did you guys think of this chapter? Do you believe that we're on trajectory for the friendship overcomes everything ending or something else? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Consequences. I just want consequences.